Bleak House by Charles Dickens, Chapter 5, A Morning Adventure. Although the morning was raw, and although the fog still seemed heavy, I say seemed, for the windows were so encrusted with dirt that they would have made midsummer sunshine dim, I was sufficiently forewarned of the discomfort within doors at that early hour and sufficiently curious about London to think it a good idea on the part of Miss Jellyby when she proposed that we should go out for a walk. Ma won't be down for ever so long, she said. And then it's a chance if breakfast's ready for an hour afterwards. They dawdle so, as to Pa, he gets what he can and goes to the office. He never has what you would call a regular breakfast. Priscilla leaves him out a loaf and some milk. When there is any overnight, sometimes there isn't any milk and sometimes the cat drinks it. But I'm afraid you must be tired, Miss Summerson and perhaps you would rather go to bed. I'm not at all tired, my dear, said I, and would much prefer to go out. If you're sure you would, returned Miss Jellyby, I'll get my things on. Ada said she would go too, and was soon astir. What with the bustle of getting myself ready and helping Ada, I was soon quite in a glow. We found Miss Jellyby trying to warm herself at the fire in the writing room. Everything was just as we had left it last night, and was evidently intended to remain so. Crumbs, dust, and waste paper were all over the house. We met Richard, who was dancing up and down, faves in to warm his feet. He was agreeably surprised to see us stirring so soon, and said he would gladly share our walk. So he took care of Ada and Miss Jellyby, and I went first. Miss Jellyby had relapsed into her sulky nature, into her sulky manner. "'Where would you wish to go?' she asked. "'Anywhere, my dear,' I replied. "'Anywhere's nowhere,' said Miss Jellyby, stopping perversely. "'Let us go somewhere, at any rate,' said I. "'She then walked me... So "'She then walked me on very fast. "'I don't care,' she said. "'Now you are my witness, Miss Summerson. "'I say I don't care, but if he has come to our house "'with his great shining lumpy forehead,' Night after night, till he was as old as Methuselah, I wouldn't have anything to say to him. Such asses as he and Ma make of themselves. My dear, I remonstrated, your duty as a child. Oh, don't talk of duty as a child, Miss Summerson. Where's Ma's duty as a parent? All made over to the public and Africa, I suppose. Then let the public and Africa show a duty as a child. It's much more their affair than mine. You are shocked, I dare say. Very well, so am I shocked too. So we are both shocked, and there's an end of it. She walked me on faster yet. But for all that, I say again, he may come and come and come, and I won't have anything to say to him. I can't bear him. If there's any stuff in the world that I hate and detest, it's the stuff he and Ma talk. I wonder the very paving stones opposite our house can have the patience to stay there and be witness of such inconsistencies and contradictions as all that sounding nonsense. I could not but understand her reference to Mr. Quayle, the young gentleman who had appeared after dinner yesterday. I was saved the disagreeable necessity of pursuing the subject by Richard and Ada, coming up at a round pace, laughing and asking us if we meant to run a race. Thus interrupted, Miss Jellyby became silent and walked moodily on my side. While I, had admi while I admired the quantity of people already going to and fro, the number of vehicles passing and repassing, and the extraordinary creatures in rags secretly groping among the swept-out rubbish for pins and other refuse, so, cousin, said the cheerful voice of Richard to Ada behind me, we are never to get rid of Chancery. We have come by another way to our place of meeting yesterday, and by the great seal here's the old lady again. Truly, there she was, immediately in front of us, curtsying and smiling, and saying, with her yesterday's air of patronage, The world's in jaundice! Very happy, I am sure. 
You are out early, ma'am, said I, as she curtsied to me. Yes, I usually walk here early, before the court sits. I collect my thoughts here for the business of the day, said the old lady mincingly. The business of the day requires a great deal of thought. Chancery justice is so very difficult to follow. Who's this, Miss Summerson? whispered Miss Jellyby. The, old, the little old lady's hearing was remarkably quick. She answered for herself directly. A suitor, my child, at your service. I have the honour to attend court regularly with my documents. Have I the pleasure of addressing another of the youthful parties in jaundice? Said the old lady. Richard good-naturedly explained that Miss Jellyby was not connected with the suit. Ha! said the old lady. She does not expect a judgment. She will still grow old, but not so old, oh dear no. This is the garden of Lincoln's Inn. I call it my garden. It is quite a bower in the summer time, where the birds sing melodiously. I pass the greater part of the long vacation here in contemplation. You find the long vacation exceedingly long, don't you? We said yes, as she seemed to expect us to say so. When the leaves are falling from the trees and there are no more flowers in bloom to make up the nosegays for the Lord Chancellor's court, said the old lady. The vacation is fulfilled. The sick seal mentioned in the revelations again prevails. Pray come and see my lodging. It will be a good omen for me. Youth and hope and beauty are very seldom there. It is a long, long time since I had a visit from either. She had taken my hand and, leading me and Miss Jellyby away, beckoned Richard and Ada to come too. I did not know how to excuse myself and looked to Richard for aid, as he was half amused and half curious, and all in doubt how to get rid of the old lady without offense. She continued to lead us away, and he and Ada continued to follow. She lived so close by that we had not time to have done humoring her for a few minutes, for a few moments before she was at home. Slipping us out at a little side gate, the old lady stopped most unexpectedly in a narrow back street, part of, so part of some courts and lanes immediately outside the wall of the inn, and said, This is my lodging. Pray walk up. She had stopped at a shop over which was written, Crook Rag and Bottle Warehouse, also in long thin letters, Crook Dealer in Marine Stories, the marine stores, bones bought, kitchen stuff bought, old iron bought, waste paper bought, ladies' and gentlemen's wardrobes bought. Everything seemed to be bought and nothing to be sold there. In the window were quantities of dirty bottles, blacking bottles, medicine bottles, ginger beer and soda water bottles, pickle bottles, wine bottles, ink bottles. There was a little tottering bench of shabby old volumes outside the door labeled Law Books All Nine Pound or All Nine D. Some of the inscriptions I have enumerated were written in law hand, like the paper I had seen in Kenjin Carboy's office, and the letters I had so long received from the firm, among them was one in the same writing having nothing to do with the business of the shop, but announcing that a respectable man, aged 45, wanted engrossing or copying to execute with neatness and dispatch. Address to Nemo, care of Mr. Crook, written. It was still As it was still foggy and dark, and as the shop was blinded beside the wall of Lincoln's Inn, intercepting the light within a couple of yards, we should not have seen so much but for the lighted lantern that an old man in spectacles and a hairy cap was carrying about in the shop. Turning toward the door, he now caught sight of us. He was short, cadaverous, and withered, with his head sunk sideways between his shoulders, and the breath issuing invisible smoke from his mouth, as if he were on fire within. His throat, chin, and eyebrows were so frosted with white hairs, and so gnarled with veins and puckered skin, that he looked from his breast upward like some old root on a fall of, in a fall, fall of snow. Hi, hi, said the old man coming to the door. Have you anything to sell? 
We naturally drew back and glanced at our conductress, who had been trying to open the house door with a key she had taken from her pocket, and to whom Richard now said that, as we had had the pleasure of seeing where she lived, we would leave her, being pressed for time, but she was not to be so easily left. She became so fantastically and pressingly earnest in her entreaties that we would walk up and see her apartment for an instant, and was so bent in her harmless way on, le on leading me on leading me in as part of the good omen she desired that I, whatever the others might do, saw nothing for it but to comply. I suppose we were all more or less curious at any rate when the old man added his persuasions to hers and said, Aye, aye, please her. It won't take a minute. Come in, come in, come in through the shop. Your t'other door were out of all. Your t'other door's out of order. We all went in, stimulated by Richard's laughing encouragements. My landlord, Crook, said the little old lady, he is called among the neighbours the Lord Chancellor. His shop is called the Court of Chancery. He is a very eccentric person. He is very odd. Oh, I assure you, he is very odd. She shook her head. She shook her hand a great many times and tapped her forehead with her finger. For he is a little, you know, mm, said the old lady with great stateliness. The old man overheard and laughed. It's true enough, he said going before us with the lantern, that they call me the Lord Chancellor and my sh and call my shop Chancery. And why th do you think they call me Lord Chancellor and my shop Chancery? I am sh I don't know, I am sure, said Richard rather carelessly. You see, said the old man, stopping and turning round, they, hi, here's lovely hair. I have got three sacks of ladies' hair below, but none so beautiful and fine as this. What colour and what texture? That'll do, my good friend, said Richard, strongly disapproving of his having drawn one of Ada's tresses through his yellow hand. You can admire as the rest of us do without taking that liberty. The old man darted at him with a sudden look, which even called my attention from Ada, who, startled and blushing, was so remarkably beautiful that she seemed to fix wandering attention of the little old lady, the wandering attention of the little old lady herself. Mr. Crook shrank into his former self as suddenly as he had leaped out of it. You see, I have so many things here, he resumed, holding up his holding up the lantern, of so many kinds, and all as the neighbors think, wasting away and going to rack and ruin, and that's why they have given me and my place a christening, and I have so many old parchmentuses and papers in my stock and all's fish that comes to my net, and I can't bear to part with anything I once lay hold of, hold of, or to alter anything, or to have any sweeping, nor scouring, nor cleaning, nor repairing going on about me. That's the way I've got the ill name of Chancery. That's the way I got the ill name of Chancery. I don't mind. I go to see my noble and learned brother pretty well every day when he sits in the inn. He don't notice me, but I notice him. There's no great odds betwixt us. We both grub on the muddle. Hi, Lady Jane! The large grey cat leaped from some neighbouring shelf onto his shoulder and startled us all. Hi, show him how you scratch. Hi, tear, my lady, said her master. The cat leapt down and ripped at a bundle of rags with her tigerish claws, with a sound that set my teeth, with a sound that it set my teeth on edge to hear. She'd do as much for any one I was to set her on," said the old man. "I deal in cat skins, among other general matters, and hers was offered to me. It's a very fine skin, but I don't have it stripped off. That weren't like chancery practice, though," says you. He had, by this time, led us across the shop and now opened a door in the back part of it, leading to the house entry. As he stood with his hand upon the lock, the little old lady graciously observed in him before passing out. That will do, Crook. You mean well, but are tiresome. My young friends are pressed for time. I have none to spare myself, having to attend court very soon. My young friends are the wards in Jaundice. Jaundice, said the old man with a start. Jaundice and Jaundice, the great suit crook. 
Hi! exclaimed the old man in a tone of thoughtful amazement and with a wider stare than before. Think of it! He seemed so rapt all in a moment and looked so curiously at us that Richard said, Why, you appear to trouble yourself a good deal about the causes before your noble and learned brother, the other Chancellor. Yes, said the old man abstractedly. Sure, your name now will be Richard Carstone. Carstone, he repeated, slowly checking off that name upon his forefinger. At each of the others he went on to mention upon a separate finger. Yes, there was the name of Barbary and the name of Clare and the name of Deadlock, too, I think. He knows as much of the case as the real salary chancellor, said Richard, quite astonished to Ada and me. I said the old man, coming slowly out of his abstraction. Yes, Tom Jandis, you'll excuse me, being related, but he never knew about the court by any other name, and was as well known there as she is now, nodding slightly at his lodger. Tom Jandis was often in here. He got into a reckless habit of strolling about when he, when the cause was on or expected, talking to the little shopkeepers and telling them to keep out of chancery whatever they did, for, says he, it's being ground to bits in a slow mill, it's being roasted at a slow fire, it's being stung to death by single bees, it's going mad by grains. He was as near making away with himself just where the young lady stands, as near could be. We listened with horror. He come in at the door, said the old man, slowly pointing an, ima an imaginary track along the, sh uh, along the shop. On the day he did it, the whole neighborhood had said for months before that he would do it of a certainty sooner or later. He come in at the door that day and walked along there. He sat himself on a bench that stood there and asked me to fetch him a pint of wine. For, says he, Crook, I am much depressed. My cause is on again, and I think I'm nearer judgment than I ever was. I persuaded him to go to the tavern over the way there, to the other side of my lane, and I followed and looked at the window and saw him comfortable, as I thought, in the armchair by the fire, and company with him, I hadn't hardly got back here when I heard a shot go echoing and rattling right away into the inn. I ran out, neighbors ran out, twenty of us cried at once, Tom Jandis! The old, man, the old man stopped, looked hard at us, looked down into the lantern, blew the light out, and shut the lantern up. We were right, I needn't tell the present hearers. Hi! To be sure, how the neighborhood poured into court that afternoon while the cause was on, how my noble and learned brother and all the rest of them gubbed and muddled away as usual and tried to look as if they hadn't heard a word of the last fact in the case, or as if they had, oh dear me, nothing at all to do with it, if they had heard of it by any chance. Ada's color had entirely left her, and Richard was scarcely less pale, nor could I wonder, judging from my emotions, and I was part and I, and I was no party in the suit. That to hearts so united and fresh, it was a shock to come into the inheritance of a protracted misery attended in the minds of many people, and with such dreadful recollections. I had another uneasiness in the application of that of the painful story to the poor half-witted creature who had brought us there, but to my surprise she seemed perfectly unconscious of that, and only led the way upstairs again. She lived at the top of the house in a pretty large room, from which she had a glimpse of Lincoln's of Lincoln's Inn of Lincoln's Inn Hall. This seemed to have been her principal inducement, originally for taking up her residence there. She could look at it she said, in the night, especially in the moonshine. Her room was clean, but very, very bare. I noticed the scantest necessities in the way of furniture, a few old prints from books, of chancellors and barristers, wafered against the wall, 
and some half dozen reticules and work bags containing doc containing documents. As she informed us, there were neither coals nor ashes in the grate. I saw no articles of clothing anywhere, nor any kind of food. There was a more affecting meaning in her pinched appearance, I thought as I looked round than I had understood before. Extremely honored, I am sure, said our poor hostess, with the greatest suavity, by this visit from the wards of Jaundice, and very much indebted for the omen. I am limited as to situation, in consequence of the necessity of attending on the Chancellor. I have lived here many years. I pass my days in court, in my evenings and my nights here. I find the nights long, for I sleep but little and think much. That is, of course, unavoidable, being in Chancery. I am sorry I cannot offer chocolate. I expect a judgment shortly, and shall then place my establishment on a superior footing. At present, I don't mind confessing in the words of to the wards of Jaundice, in strict confidence, that I sometimes find it difficult to keep up a genteel appearance. I have felt the cold here. It matters very little. Pray excuse the introduction of such mean topics. She partly drew aside the curtain of the long, low garret window and called our attention to a number of bird cages hanging there, some containing several birds. There were larks, linnets, and goldfinches. I should think at least twenty. I began to keep the little creatures, she said, with an object that the wards will readily comprehend with the intention of restoring them to liberty. When my judgment should be given, yes, they die in prison, though. Their lives, poor silly things, are so short in comparison with chancery proceedings, that one by one the whole collection has died over and over again. I doubt, do you know, whether one of these, though they are all young, will live to be free. Very mortifying, is it not? Although she sometimes asked a question, she never seemed to expect a reply, but rambled on as if she were in a habit of doing so. When no one but herself was present, indeed, she pursued, I have unsettled and the sixth or great seal still prevails, I may not one day be found lying stark and senseless here, as I have found so many birds. Richard answered what he saw in Ada's compassionate eyes, took the opportunity of laying some money softly and unobserved on the chimney piece. We all drew nearer to the cages, feigning to examine the birds. I can allow them to sing much, said the old lady, for, you'll think this curious, I find my mind confused by the idea that they are singing while I am following the arguments in court, and my mind requires to be very clear, you know. Another time I'll tell you their names, not at present. On a day of such good omen they shall sing as much as they like in honour of youth, a smile and curtsy, hope, a smile and curtsy, and beauty, a smile and curtsy there, will let in the full light. The birds began to stir and chirp. I cannot admit the air freely, said the old lady. The room was close and would have been the better for it, because the cat you saw downstairs called Lady Jane is greedy for their lives. She crouches on the parapet outside for hours and hours, I have discovered, while peering, whispering mysteriously, that her natural curiosity is sharpened by a jealous fear of their regaining their liberty in consequence of the judgment I expect being shortly given. She is sly and full of malice. Some neighboring bells, reminding the poor soul that it was half past nine, did more for us in the way of bringing our visit to an end than we could easily have done for ourselves. She hurriedly took up her little bag of documents, which she had laid upon the table on coming in, and asked if we were also going into court. On our answering no, and that we would on no account detain her, she opened the door to attend us downstairs. With such an omen, it is even more necessary than usual that I should be there before the Chancellor comes in, she said, for he might mention my case the first thing. I have a presentiment that he will mention it the first thing this morning. She stopped to tell us in a whisper, 
as we were going down that the whole house was filled with strange lumber, which her landlord had bought piecemeal and had no wish to sell in consequence of being a little enem. This was the first, this was on the first floor. But she had made a previous stoppage on the second floor and had silently pointed at a dark door there. The only other lodger, she whispered in explanation, a law writer. The children in lanes here say he sold himself to the devil. I don't know what he can have done with the money. Hush! She appeared to mistrust that the lodger might hear her. Even there and repeating, hush, went before us on tiptoe, as though even the sound of her footsteps might reveal to him what she had said, passing through the shop on our way out. As we had passed through on our way in, we found the old man storing a quantity of packets of waste paper in a kind of well in the floor. He seemed to be working hard and had a piece of chalk by him, by which, as he put each separate package or bundle down, he made a crooked mark on the paneling of the wall. Richard and Ada and Miss Jellybee and the little old lady had gone by him, and I was going when he touched me on the arm and chalked the letter J upon the wall in a very curious manner, beginning with the, the end of the letter and shaping it backwards. It was a capital letter, not a printed one, but just such a letter as any clerk in Messrs. Kenge and Carboy's office would have made. Can you read it? he asked me with a keen glance. Surely said I. It's very plain. What is it? J. With another glance at me and a glance at the door, he rubbed it out and turned an A in its place, not a capital letter this time, and said, What's that? I told him. Then he rubbed that out and turned to the letter R and asked me the same question. He went on quickly until he had formed in the same curious manner the word jarndyce without leaving two letters on the wall together. What does that spell? he asked me. When I told him, he laughed the same, in the same odd way, yet with the same rapidity. He then produced, singly, and rubbed out singly the letters forming the words Bleak House. These, in some astonishment, I also read, and he laughed again. Hi, said the old man, laying aside the chalk. I have a turn for copying from memory, you see, miss, though I can neither read nor write. He looked disagreeable, and his cat looked so wickedly at me, as if I were a blood relation of the birds upstairs, that I was quite relieved by Richard's appearing at the door and saying, Miss Summerson, I hope you are not bargaining for the sale of your hair. Three sacks below are quite enough, Mr. Crook. I lost no time in wishing Mr. Crook good morning and joining my friends outside, where we parted with the little old lady, who gave us her blessing with great ceremony and renewed her assurance of yesterday by reference to her intention of settling estates on Ada and me. Before we finally turned out of those lanes, we looked back and saw Mr. Crook standing at his shop door in his spectacles looking after us, with his cat upon his shoulder. Quite an adventure for a morning in London, said Richard with a sigh. Ah, cousin, cousin, it's a weary world, this chancery. It is to me, and has been ever since I can remember, returned Ada. I am grieved that I should be the enemy, as I suppose I am, of a great number of relations of and others, and that they should be my enemies as I suppose they are, and that we should all be ruining one another without knowing how or why, and be in constant doubt and discord all our lives. It seems very strange, as there must be, a, be right somewhere, that an honest judge in real estate has not been able to find out through all these years where it is. Ah, cousin, said Richard, strange indeed, all this wasteful wanton chess playing is very, is very strange. To see that composed court yesterday jogging on so serenely and to think of the wretchedness of the pieces on the board gave me a headache and the headache gave me a headache and the heartache both together. My head ached with wondering how it happened. If men were neither fools nor rascals and my heart ached to think they could possibly be either. 
But at all events, Ada, may I call you Ada? Of course you may, Cousin Richard. At all events, Chancery will work none of its bad influences on us. We have happily been brought together, thanks to our good kinsman, and, and it can't divide us now. Never, I hope, Cousin Richard, said Ada gently. In half an hour after our arrival, Mrs. Jellyby appeared, and in course of an hour, the various things necessary for breakfast straggled by one into the dining room straggled one by one into the dining room. I do not doubt that Mrs. Jellyby had gone to bed and got up as in the usual manner, but she presented no appearance of having changed her dress. She was greatly occupied during breakfast, for the morning's post brought a heavy correspondence relative to Boreo Bulaga. The children tumbled about, and notched memoranda of their accidents in their legs, which were perfect little calendars of distress. At one o'clock, an open carriage arrived for us, and a cart for our luggage. Mrs. Jellyby charged us with many remembrances to her good friend, Mr. Jarndyce. Caddy left her desk to see us depart, kissed me in the passage, and stood, biting her pen and sobbing on the steps. Peepy, I'm happy to say, was asleep. All the other children got up behind the bar behind the baroche and fell off, and we saw them with great concern scattered over the surface over the surface of Thaves Inn as we rolled out of its precincts. And that is the end of chapter five.